I've been with them for six weeks doing a financial uh, education series for returning citizens. Um, really? Uh, yeah, it's uh, actually a pretty good program. So I see Jay at 12th and Chestnut. Yeah, so are you are you teaching a lot of budgeting and money management type stuff? Yeah, it was like financial basics. Okay. Um, you know, budgeting, how credit works, um, taxes, under explaining how the tax system works, mm. uh, so people understand what they have to pay, the difference between being a business owner and W-2 employee, mm. um, you know, intro to investing, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so and are they, are they receptive to it or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were actually really receptive. I had a good class. i um, supposed to start the second cohort in um, – uh, at the end of October, we're going to do it again. Oh, um, oh, that's awesome. That's, uh, that's pretty awesome. You yeah. are moving and shaking. Uh, something like that. Yeah. We're hey, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Gotta right? get out. I'm uh, also doing a marriage conference in October, uh, October 21st in Columbia, Maryland. My husband and mm. I are going to do a financial freedom workshop for the UCBA, um, marriage conference. So is, is your husband in the business too? He's not officially in the business. We do some workshops together. Um, he's an HR consultant and a pastor. Um, uh, so he does, um, but he's big on leadership training and uh, he's a teacher just by gifting. So uh, we often do workshops together. We do them out of the office sometimes, especially when it comes to couples and managing money. Um, so we talk a little bit about how to make that not so combative uh, <laughs> uh, how do how do we talk about it or how do we do it? <laughs> how do you make it not combative? I've um, got some more stories. Yeah, well, number one, appreciating each other's uh, perspectives, recognizing that you know you could be very well there to balance each other out. So where one is too heavy in one thing, uh, the other is probably on the opposite end of the spectrum. You got to really respect that balance. Mm -hmm and value the other person's opinion when it comes to, to managing money. And if you can start there with at least some level of humility and, and giving each other some, some grace, um, you can do a lot. Mm. <laughs> All right. So what's the weirdest marriage counseling money session you've ever been in? Weirdest. Uh, or most complicated. Oh, I got a lot of complications. Um, I will remember one session I had with uh, some clients that um, <laughs> most common, I would say, is hiding money from each other. Yeah, that happens a lot. <laughs> and I, I'll get the phone call later uh, the next day after the meeting to say, oh, by the way, I've got this other account right. that I didn't tell you about in the meeting. Mm. Um, I, my husband or my wife doesn't know about this account, but I... I need to see how this factors in or I've gotten a call uh, while one person was contemplating divorce, um, calling me to check the money first. Mm. Uh, you know, what's my half? <laughs> what's their half? <laughs> uh, I've got, yeah, 18 years in the business. You get a lot of, you get a lot of stories. Well, did you always do marriage counseling? Well, from a money perspective um, or a lot of married clients? I mean, I had a lot of married clients all the time. Um, so yeah. I guess, just inadvertently you end up in some kind of marriage counseling capacity because mm -hmm. money is one of those things that couples fight about a lot. Yep. Um, so yep. if you're, you know, going to be the person that is in charge of helping guide them, um, then you're going to inevitably just break up some fights every now and again. Yeah. I actually had a couple get into a physical altercation. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I just love <laughs> Yeah. You got to just leave in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I wasn't gonna get in the middle of it because it's like a no-win situation. So I just left. No, no, I've had financial plans be used in divorce proceedings. Yeah, that happens. Um, actually, I have I have a client now um, who's going through a divorce who needed our tax work back because they they use all that all that stuff comes into play. Yeah. People don't even realize it. Yeah. And usually, what I find is, you know, people say money is uh, the the cause of divorce. I I say it's lack of communication. I agree. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, people don't take the time to really get to understand how their partner, their mate, their spouse communicates. Right. Um, and really understand what's important. Right, wrong, or indifferent, right? Because 
that's a whole other conversation. But right. if you knew your husband liked to play Xbox um, and he work his nine to five and come home and that's all he wanted to do. And then you're mad at him when that's what he does. You know, what, what do you want to do there? What do you want to do? <laughs> right. And I see that a lot. I see that a lot. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about life insurance. So why do you think life insurance is important? Well, I, there's always been a saying that you should have life insurance if you love someone or you owe someone or both. Mm. Uh, because it costs money to be born and it costs money to die. And Ain't that true? <laughs> You you know you might not have had a choice uh, of how much it costs when you got here, um, but to leave you know that you're leaving some people with some burdens, um, mm. and you definitely don't want money to be a burden if it doesn't have to be because it's already hard to grieve the loss of a loved one. When you add financial uh, hardship on top of that, right? Um, then you, you know you really you can take the time now to ensure that at least that won't be an issue. Right, right. Or at least it won't be an issue from a lack of it. Um, right. Fighting over it is a completely different story. But if you love someone or you owe someone, you should have some life insurance. So did you get any, uh, I'm not leaving this lady no money to buy a pink Cadillac or to move some man into my house comments? Absolutely. I'm talking to couples about life insurance. <laughs> Absolutely. People look at me and they think I'm lying when I be telling those stories. I'm like, no, no, it's, it's real. People are like, I don't want to fund, you know, her and her new boyfriend or him and his younger wife. I'm not, no. I'm not doing that. And you know, I think we look at life insurance incorrectly. Like, if you look at what it actually costs to check out of this life, um, and not even talking about the medical expenses that could come beforehand potentially, we're talking about burial you know, opening the ground costs money if you're, you know, going traditional and having, you know, a funeral and a casket and uh, repast and all of that uh, and what they charge for those things. Um, somebody's got to pay and, and we shouldn't just always go to GoFundMe for, for these kind of issues. No, I mean, a decent sized funeral could cost just as much as a decent sized wedding. Absolutely. And to me, that's crazy i mean my uncle just passed earlier this week so life insurance has definitely been uh especially on my mind i can't help it you know as professionals every time we see somebody die like we always say we hope they have coverage exactly and then people don't people look at us and they think we're insensitive and we're just right like, right yeah, but they don't get it because you don't see the other side right because we see what happens when there is no more money coming in and so for everybody that's just watching thank you for all for watching but life insurance primarily is used to replace income, right? right? So the average the average income in America is about fifty thousand dollars, and so let's say you got a man and a wife, a couple, and they got a little baby. Let's say they're about 30, 30 years old. Well, that gentleman, because men, I'm a pick on the men because we usually die sooner than the women because they drive us crazy. But uh, <laughs> but <laughs> is that why though? <laughs> Hey, that's what that's my story. I'm thinking. I, I, I've seen you guys also don't take care of yourselves very well. And are least likely to go to the doctor for issues. Well, listen, you mess it up my joke. So I'm only here <laughs> I, just wanna, for I just want to put it out there and make sure <laughs> that you're giving the women a fair shake here. All right. But anyway, the, the average couple, 30 years old, right? Man dies. You know, that baby is going to be around for at least another 20 years. 18, right? On the minimum, go to college the whole nine. So they just lost $50,000 that coming to the household every year. Right. And you add 20 years of that, that's a million dollars. So a million dollars coming out of any household is going to be drastic. I mean, that's the example I kind of stick with. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I think about is years ago, when I was at another life insurance agency, there was a homegirl of mine that I grew up with that grew up a block away from me. And they died from brain cancer. And she had a family and she had uh, a husband and a whole nine. And one thing I was proud of, even though she was not my client, somebody at my firm had written a decent sized policy on her. I was like, all right, mm -hmm. cool. Like their family won't have to worry about money, right. you know, because it's one thing that, to, because to, you're going to be emotional during that time, right? So you're going to be emotionally distraught. Who the hell wants to be emotionally distraught and financially distraught all at the same time? Right. That's not a good combination, yeah. you know? Yeah, I've definitely seen my fair share of 
you know, I've had clients pass away. I've had their loved ones pass away and the stress and the pressure when one of their relatives dies and doesn't have life insurance and they're scrambling around trying to figure out how they're going to pay for the funeral, how they're going to continue to live in the house or people that had to move, uh, you know, from a house to an apartment because they just couldn't afford to keep the house on one salary right? Uh, or, you know, didn't plan ahead. Uh, I've seen second marriages where, you know, financial decisions were made prior to, um, you know, the passing of, of a spouse and then they get married again uh, and then somebody dies and they never really bothered to check the life insurance again. So they, they ended up stuck yep. uh, and with, you know, older children, they're like, oh, I don't need it. But they didn't never consider what their spouse would would need. So it's not just for children; it's also no. for surviving spouses. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you if you love someone, you want to make sure they're good and the good times and the bad, right? Financially, you know, as much as possible. But we don't like dealing with mortality. So, like we were joking, talking about some of the stories we got about you know moving a young girl in the house or or having you know, the pink Cadillac, I think those are all kind of smoke screens to say, I really don't want to deal with my death. I don't want to deal with my mortality. Right. But it's something that's going to happen. It's inevitable. It's a part of life. Death is a part of life. Death in taxes, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How about that? <laughs> I mean, it's it's not nice, but it's just one of those things. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, having to, to walk clients through this um, and get them to really think about what the reality of that looks like, it you know, I have some clients who have a stay-at-home parent and they're thinking, oh, well, I don't need life insurance on that person because they're not working. But that's not true because if they're a stay-at-home parent, you're going to have to pay somebody to do what they're doing. Right, absolutely. And they bring huge financial value to the household in right. ways that probably haven't been quantified. Um, I think I saw some... Um, uh, years ago, probably in the mid 2000s, I saw uh, uh, somebody tried to calculate exactly what a stay at home parent um, brought to the home in terms of financial value. And it was something like the equivalent of a $65,000 a year salary job. It's probably more than that. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming it's more than that because this was, you know, back in like uh, early 2000, early mid 2000s. So adjusted for inflation is even more, but. I mean, but uh, just look at the cost. Just look at the cost of daycare. Like it's one mm-hmm. of the biggest ripoffs out there. I mean, so you avoid that work just to pay daycare. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, that stay at home parent a lot of times is stay at home mom. But you know, they're footing that bill because they're 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 handling that responsibility. Exactly. Thirteen, fifteen, hundred, two thousand dollars a month. Right. Oh, and that's that's not the highest. I remember one point I was. <laughs> And almost like three grand a month. Oh my god! I, I had to, and I, yeah, we almost died over that. Like, so, yeah, and I would. But, uh, <laughs> we uh, we had two in at the same time because my two youngest are stair stuff. They're like eighteen months apart, so it's it's crazy. It's wow. crazy. Yeah. So, so, all right, for anybody watching, just watching, this is the Money Hour. I'm Kamari Ellis. We're talking with Shana Harvey. She is the owner of Insight totally. Advisory Group. Yeah. Right? Did I get it right? That's yeah, it's like yeah. total stewardship, but yeah. It's like total stewardship. All right. That well, okay. I'll work on that. I'll work on that. But we're talking about life insurance. We're talking about the power of life insurance. So again, if you're just now joining us, add your uh, question or comment in the uh comment section and please share us with somebody who needs to be thinking about life insurance. And that's just about everybody. So I'll um, put it out there. I, I, I tell everybody now you should have a million dollars in coverage especially from a community standpoint, a black standpoint, it's like, well, what would happen to the community if everybody had a million dollars coverage, right? You know, it's going to pay. So that's a million dollars going in everybody's house. And you, can get, <laughs> you can get a million dollars in coverage. And we'll talk about different types of coverage a little bit in a little bit, but you can spend anywhere, let's say from 50 to 75 bucks to get a million dollars in coverage for the right person, right age and the right health. Because yeah. all those things are a fact. They are, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, you should at least look to cover, um, you know, a, at least some a couple years of income, uh, get people back on their feet, not have them make decisions, decisions that they normally wouldn't make uh, mm. out of pressure, financial pressure, 
um, look at uh, the various ways to to decide on your coverage. I don't know if we want to talk about human life value versus capital needs or things mm. like that. So some people say, I don't, I don't want people to have a million dollars, but add up everything you owe. Um, and you know, the house that you own or a uh, mortgage or what it would cost for somebody to, you know, rent for 10 years. If you're right. not, there. Um, that's well, a lot of money. It is. I mean, I come to the million, right? The average income is about 50. I think it's like 54,000, right? usually you can buy you can buy insurance in multiples of years so you can buy 20 uh, 10 20 25 i think is as high as 30 right mm -hmm. so they'll let you buy again fifty thousand dollars times 10 will be five hundred thousand if you if they'll let you do 20 times your salary it'll be a million bucks mm -hmm. if they let you do 30 times your salary it'll be 1.5 million so i just kind of go in the middle and say a million because it's a round number and it's easy for everybody to get to it. And, and I also think that any of my clients have got a million dollars, I could probably set up an account for them and easily get 5% a year without them ever touching that million bucks, just as income. Sure. And that'll pay out forever, right. right? So now we're getting into legacy and generational wealth. Just imagine if your family, you know, your wife or your spouse, you left them a $50,000 income, but not only will she get it, the kids will get it. And we don't have to touch that million unless we absolutely have to. So, you know, that could be, you know, an extra 50 grand coming into the household could be, could be major. Right. You know, so that's why I always say, you know, a million in every household, what would that look like? Yeah, it, um, would, it would definitely change the landscape. Yeah, now I don't want to get into what they're going to spend it on. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I ain't going to go that deep. Right. I ain't going to go that deep, but you know, for some families, it, it would it would make a whole world of difference. Yeah, a whole world of difference. Definitely. So, so what's the weirdest thing you've seen um, when helping your clients do life insurance? Um, the weirdest. I have to think about the weirdest thing. I think I've seen um, people not want to cover. You know, like we talked about the potential uh, girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, and some people don't want to actually get uh, health screenings. I think that's probably the, the weirdest situation or most frustrating situation is those who don't go through the process of life insurance. And mm -hmm. I've had that in, you know, we were joking earlier about men dying earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say, you know, you guys don't want to go to the doctor, but um, that is actually has been a hindrance for some people because they don't want to take the exam, um, the blood and urine exam, or to have anybody poking in their medical records um, because of uh, that fear. They would just rather not cover themselves for life insurance at all. Right, right. I mean, one of the things that opened my eyes is that there are a lot more drug users than you realize. Yeah. And I'm talking hard drugs, not weed, nothing, you know, hard drugs. <laughs> it, it's, it's very surprising. It's, it's yeah. very surprising. I've had that come out a couple of times. Yeah. And I guess probably because I'm from an era where um, we kind of look down on drug users to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, we probably, at least in my neighborhood, we kind of, we revered the drug dealer more than we did the drug user, you know, and I don't want to get into... <laughs> I don't want to get into, you know, the morality of it all, right? I mean, because th there's something bad to say about both um, when you really look at it from more of a mature lens. But it it's just weird to me now that there are a lot of people that do drugs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so that, that creates an issue. I think one thing that many people take for granted is that they think they're always going to be able to qualify for life insurance. Right. And, and you're not, and that's why the benefit of getting it while you're younger is so important. Yeah, while you're young, while you're healthy, um, getting something that you are gonna have for the rest of your life can make a difference because you don't know what's gonna develop. Um, I've definitely had people who, you know, I talked to them about life insurance, you know, five years ago. And then they come back five years later and say, oh yeah, we're, we're ready to do that now. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can't get it because within that five years, they develop some kind of a health issue that is now preventing them from getting coverage. 
Mm. So, um, you know, it's important to address it while you have the ability to get access to insurance um, because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Right. So, you know, you think you're young and healthy now, but anything could happen. Something, uh, and if it does, you might not be insurable. Right, right. I mean, I believe it was life insurance how Magic Johnson found out he had HIV. Mm. So, you know, a lot of times people don't want to find out. They don't want to know what's going on. Yeah, I had a guy who didn't, he he really refused. He only wanted to stick to group coverage mm. um, because he didn't want to apply for his own because he said, I don't want the first time I find out that I have something to be through a life insurance exam. That was a, a real fear for him. And I was trying to get him to kind of get over that, but um, for his family's sake, because your job coverage is not guaranteed in, in terms of, you know, you might not be at that job forever. Uh, you can always port, um, which for those watching, that means once you leave the employer, you can take the group insurance with you, but it's usually a lot more expensive. Yeah, because you uh, don't have to go through underwriting the same way. Right. So they got to charge you for that. Right. Um, so this was, and it was a cheap policy. It wasn't even like, it was probably $25, $30 a month for an extra like $250,000 of coverage. Um, but because of that, he... You know, he really did not want to go through that exam. Hmm. Do you have a favorite type of life insurance? When you uh, favor another? I mean, term works well for me. And <laughs> if you're if you're also investing, um, I think it's cheap. Uh, I don't think people fund permanent policies well enough for them to be of great value. Well, let's do let's do this because I don't want to leave anybody behind. Can you break down the different types of life insurance? Yeah, sure. So you have term coverage, which is uh, it's like renting insurance for a particular period of time. You have uh, a certain number of years that you're going to be insured for. You have a fixed premium typically for those number of years. But after that time frame is over, you no longer have insurance. So you have to get a new policy. You have to, um, sometimes you can do it without new um, total underwriting again, but most often you have to get insured at an older age and potentially with some extra health issues. Um, but it's designed to cover certain periods of time where your needs are greater. So while you have small children, while you still have a mortgage, before you accumulate enough assets to retire, um, it covers you for a particular period of time. And usually you can get larger amounts for a low cost. Um, then you have permanent policies, which uh, could come in the form of whole life insurance, um, which you're also going to have a savings component to those policies. So you'll pay a higher premium because they're going to cover you for your whole life. Um, but in addition to paying for the insurance, you also have um, some savings that are building up within the policy that you could tap for other resources later on you know, paying for college, uh, an extra uh, retirement savings. Um, and you all could have that in various forms. You can have fixed policies. You could have index policies, which means that your premium and the savings component is going to go to uh, fund sub accounts that perform like mutual funds uh, and variable policies, or um, they could mirror uh, the performance of uh, an index in the stock market. Um, so they're going to have various ways for you to save in that policy and potentially invest as well. Um, those policies typically need to be funded well. So you have to have uh, good cash flow because the premiums are higher and the costs are higher. Um, you typically have, you know, long surrender periods. Um, you have, All right, guys, tell them what a surrender is. Uh, surrender periods means you take this money out uh, early, they're going to penalize you. Right. It could be 10, 15 percent within a certain period of time. It usually goes down every year uh, so that by the end of that surrender period, you no longer have to pay. But it guarantees that you're going to keep your money there for that amount of time. Uh, and if you don't, then they're going to penalize you for it. So you won't get all your money back um, if you take it out. So uh, those are some of the caveats of these permanent policies. 
um, that I always try to help people be aware of. So if your cash flow is not um, that strong, I'll usually probably recommend term most of the time. Right. Um, but if you can afford it, then I also would recommend you have something permanent, even if it's a small permanent policy, just to guarantee that you have insurance for the rest of your life so that no matter what happens, whether it's twenty five dollars or $50,000 worth of insurance, you can at least get that at the same time you're getting this term coverage to cover your um, more short-term needs, but always have insurance even into your old age. Um, having a whole life policy that you can fund early really helps to, to make sure that even in your 60s or 70s or 80s, you might still have insurance. Right, right, so right. Usually a combination could work well. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's funny how life insurance has been around for over a, hundred, a couple hundred years, actually. Yeah. And there's still a lot of misunderstanding about the topic. And and so that, you know, that's part of the reason why I said, all right, I want to just start talking about this because, I mean, people have brought a lot of life insurance for me over the years because I'm, I'm not learned, licensed right now, so nobody can buy from me. So I can go talk trash and promote it as much as I want, right? Because I do, <laughs> I do have some problems with some agents, right? And there are a lot of life insurance agents who are masquerading around as quote unquote financial advisors, quote unquote um, financial planners. Right. Or before I say what I want to say, there are some fun life agents, right? That are very, very knowledgeable and know their stuff. But then there's something, all they want to do is sell you a policy. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen it, I've seen it firsthand, right? So that it kind of gives me a bitter taste for it. I always tell people I love investments, but I have to bow down and submit to the fact that I think life insurance, life insurance is probably the best financial instrument ever created because it can do so many things. And Shayna was explaining um, some of the cash value life insurance or the guaranteed life insurance. The money you put in there, you can set it up where so the money can go in and grow tax free. Mm -hmm. And then there's ways you can pull it out tax free. So, I mean, you can, you can do a lot with life insurance. One, if you have the cash flow to support it, like you said, and two, I, you know, this is no, no diss or shots to anybody. You, I think there's a certain level of sophistication you also need when dealing with it as well. Sure. But, you know, that's nothing a little education can't overcome. Uh, the, you know, the question is, are you willing to overcome it? But And I think with those kind of policies, you also it helps to have an advisor um, walking with you. A real advisor. Process, a real advisor. Yes. Uh, to keep you, because I, you know, when I left other companies, I had clients who just stopped paying for their insurance because I left. Um, and then I catch up with them years later and they're like, oh yeah, we just stopped paying for that. Um, Cause nobody was there to tell them, hey. Don't this drop this. Cause you might not be able to get it back. Um, now, fortunately, for those types of policies, they were permanent policies. Um, so the cash value kept growing. And that was one of the advantages. Right. So it didn't lapse then? Yeah, it didn't lapse. Okay. They still had insurance. They just stopped paying the premium. Gotcha. But they had been paying it for, you know, seven, eight years. Right. Uh, and then stopped because there was nobody there to continue to guide them to say, hey, this is this could really be a robust thing for your family's financial future. Right. If you keep funding this. Right. Um, right. But without coaching, uh, a lot of people, when they have to make decisions about cash flow, life insurance is one of the first things that they might drop. It's absolutely one of the first things they might drop. Yeah. yeah. And, so you know, we that's have a, the best thing. We have a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, Latia Taylor asks, what do you suggest for a parent over 60 without insurance, a term or a whole life policy? It it was, with a, a parent over 60. what would you yeah there's a question again thanks for the question let's see it what do you suggest for a parent over 60 years of age without insurance mm. a term or a whole life policy uh well term is definitely going to be more cost effective so uh, but you would need to probably analyze their finances to make sure that um you know, that's the right recommendation. And you also have to look at what assets they already have. Uh, some people, as they age and they do have assets, um, they may be what we able to uh, call self-insure, mm -hmm. meaning 
they might be able to set aside some money for funeral, burial costs, things like that. If they don't, if they're not in that position, then insurance is definitely something you want to look at. I think the oldest person I've ever gotten insurance for was in their 70s when I bought it for them. Um, but it still had value because uh, we got a 10 year term policy just to cover them up until they're 80. And at the same time, we started saving as well so that by the end of that term, they could replace that term policy with their own savings mm. so that their family wouldn't actually be in jeopardy of not being able to cover insurance costs. So it may not just be a function of buying insurance um, because we also don't know if they're insurable. Sure. Um, and the older you get, the more health issues you potentially could have. Um, so we want to also create some other opportunities, maybe with um, cash flow planning, asset management to uh, cover those kinds of costs, just in case they're not insurable or just in case it's not cost effective to get a longer term policy. You might be able to only get, you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, so but otherwise, you know, it could just get too expensive. And Latia, uh, just to piggyback off of that, if if your parent is not insurable, uh, you could potentially look for what's called guaranteed or, or uh, final cost uh, policies. Right. They can be a bit costly, uh, but the underwriting isn't um, anywhere as near tedious as a, a regular policy. And I believe actually they don't really do any underwriting at all, but they're they're very expensive. And the other caveat is, if if your parent, if the person were to die within a certain time frame, mm -hmm. they won't pay out. If I remember correctly, they'll give yeah. you your premium back, but they won't pay out the death benefit. Yeah, some of them have tiers uh, right. where you'll okay. get like percentages okay. of the total death benefit if it's like over a five year period. Mm -hmm. If they die within five years, you might get you know a certain percent of that death benefit. And it's almost like guaranteeing that they're going to get premium for a certain amount of time without having to pay you the full right. uh, amount of the policy because they're not underwriting. Right. And, and that's a lot of risk for them. I mean, listen, life insurance companies are in the money for, I mean, in the business to make money. Um, they Again, they can be very, very helpful, but they're looking to make money at the end of the day. Right. And, you know, a lot of people don't think about this in contestability period. Um, there, there are some things you can't do. Oh, well, let me back up. Incontestability period, usually a two-year two period when you first get your policy, that if certain things happen, for example, like suicide, if you try to, if you commit suicide within the first two years of the policy, you're not getting paid. Right. Um, now, it was funny. I was having a conversation with somebody else um, that was saying since there's so many Black men being shot and killed that are running the streets. They said, well, they should get they should get a life insurance policy on them. And I said, I don't think life insurance will pay if you're in a commission of a crime. Um, and I think that's beyond contestability. So I would have to, I got to look that one up. I mean, yeah, I think it would depend on the uh, what clauses they have in your contract. Right. Uh, so when you agree to a life insurance policy, you're actually signing a contract. Contract. And it comes in a thick book. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of things that you're probably not going to read that you know give them outs if you do something where they don't have to pay and tells you under what conditions they will pay um and some of those clauses might be in there um where they won't, won't pay usually it is two years for suicides um commission of a crime they might have a case to say we're not going to pay for this right um if you lied on your application and said that mm -hmm. you didn't have you know some disease or uh something like that where um, they would have not offered you insurance had you told the truth. Um, they may not pay out for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are things that um, give them the right to not pay as well. Mm -hmm. So Mark Daniels said normally called graded benefit policy. I don't think I've ever heard of that before. Have you heard of that before? Graded, uh, graded benefit? Yeah, think... graded benefit policy. Yeah, I don't. I don't offer them, but I've I've seen them before where the death benefit um, changes from you know a certain number oh, of years. Okay, okay, right. I think you, right. you probably have seen that before. I've I've never sold one like that. Yeah, no, I haven't sold it. Okay, so I hope I'm saying your name right. Nazir Levine asked if you utilize the cash value within your life insurance, will you have to pay it back? 
Have to? No. Uh, well, sort of. <laughs> so kind of depends. Um, if you don't pay it back, it comes off the death benefit. So you and, personally. And? And um, you will continue. It might erode um, your cash value. And? And what? What am I missing? It's excellent. Oh, yeah. Taxes. <laughs> of course. Yeah. You might have to pay taxes because uh, the way you have to structure it to not pay taxes um, is a little bit different. Uh, so you might want to, if you're going to take it out, you either have to sometimes uh, lower the death benefit if it's a variable policy that you can change so that um, the distance between the cash value and the death benefit is um, an appropriate amount of distance for it to still qualify as life insurance. Um, so there are some ways that you just need to uh, make sure you talk to your agent about structuring it properly to make sure that you don't have to pay taxes on it. But uh, if you end up not paying the loan back, then uh, it, it might come off the death benefit to your heirs. Uh, Mark Daniel said, uh cash use accrues interest as well yes so yes if you borrow if you borrow um cash from your cash value life insurance policy yes you will have to pay back the interest but you're paying yourself you're paying yourself yeah, yeah you're paying you're paying yourself but i mean that's that's one of the benefits of using the cash inside of your life insurance policy but um you know, the, the only people who I see really use that are the more affluent. Right. Um, I haven't seen many regular everyday folks, even though they can, right? You can get, you know, if you're young, right? If you, let's say you're 25 and you get, I don't know, a $50,000 whole life policy, right? And you overfund that sucker. Oh. By the time you're 50. It's money. You can sit in bed. I mean, I've, I've been in the business long enough now to have sold policies 18 years ago. Right. Um, and it has been really rewarding to see those who funded it well pay for their kids' college out mm -hmm. of the policies or, um, you know, buy a house from right. policies or um, to supplement their retirement income with those policies. So, you know, it was good to know that what I said to them 18, 17 16 years ago was true uh, and it played out that way because it did do what we thought it was going to do but right. they did have to fund it well in order to get it there and you can't you know not pay attention to it you can't just drop it um, but yeah I, I get excited when I see the fruit of you know financial advice come into fruition and people actually sending their kids to school with these kinds of things. Yeah, and I mean, I, I have been fortunate enough that I still have some life enforced on the street, but I've never delivered uh, a death benefit. So, you know, I, the closest I came to was the friend of mine that, you know, I had, and I didn't deliver the death benefit, thank God. But, um, you know, I saw it and I knew the details of it. But I know it's a beautiful thing and it's a very sad thing all at the same time for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, when you can see that but it's got to be a wonderful thing when you take a check or now the debit card and checking account yeah, <laughs> to yeah. the family and you know you give them a hundred thousand dollar check a five hundred thousand dollar check a million dollar check and know at least they have a little bit of cushion and it just relieves a lot of the angst in that moment yeah for them to, uh, to go forward yeah i can definitely i've had several clients pass away um and i've dealt with the heirs and it is a world of difference when money is not something that they're thinking about right. uh, because they have enough. They're not, you know, trying to come up with the money. They know they can still stay in the house. They know their kids don't have to come out of, you know, the school that they're paying for or the daycare, um, that they have some time that they could take off from work to continue to grieve well. Um, and people are not forced back. Um, that that makes a difference in their lives, and you know, as sad as an occasion as it is, um, this is one of one of the ways that we can at least lighten the load a little bit, uh, where finances are not going to add to that burden. Right. 
I mean, is there anything else you would think that people should be thinking about as it relates to their life insurance? Um, I would say just think, uh, also remembering that uh, student loans, people are coming out nowadays with a lot of student loans. Uh, federal loans are typically forgiven at death, but private loans are not. So they uh, do follow the estate with the private loans, but federal loans are typically forgiven if the person passes away. Um, yeah, but if the, as long as the insurance isn't flowing through the estate, it's going to an individual, so they don't. No, I meant in terms of what the what claims somebody might have against the estate. So, oh, okay. You know, if it's probated and it's like, uh, hey, this this person owed me money. Gotcha. Um, they have a claim against that, so um, private student loans might be subject to to that because they're also not, I think, dismissible even in bankruptcy. So private student loans get you locked down even when you die. Yeah, don't don't get me started on that. I think that's like one of the biggest ripoffs uh, ever. I mean, I'm a big believer in college and, and even taking student loans, but for the life of me, I don't understand why interest rates on student loans aren't treated the same way that they treat mortgages. No, um, yeah. Um, not. You know, they, they have like this super jacked up rate um, and a mortgage is dismissible in bankruptcy. Right. But not private student loans. But, but not student loans. <laughs> yeah. So we have another question for Latia. Latia, part of your question cut off and I can't get to it. Um, you know, maybe I can look at it this way. Uh, but her question is, if a person has a total of 30K saved and they can only afford the premium of a 30K policy, should they, should they, all right, that's the last part I can't see, Latia. And it won't it let me, it won't let me expand the question. Maybe I can look at it this way. Should they, should they, oops, that's not what I want. Let's see, can I see it this way? Oh, I can see it now. Oh, you can see it? Yeah. If a person has a total of 30K saved and they can only afford the premium of a 30K policy, should they get the policy anyway? Mm. Or just rely on the savings? Uh, may not hesitate to give like blanket advice just with that because um, the answer is it depends. Um, the 30K in savings, was it originally designated to be kind of a, a life insurance-like account, or is it being used for uh, living purposes and emergencies? Um, if they can afford the premium, then um, usually I would say it might make sense to do it because you're probably not, I don't know what the premium is, um, but you may not pay $30,000 out over the life of that policy. Right. So it's good. It'll essentially double the assets um, if they do pass away within the time frame of that policy, as opposed to depleting the assets um, by using the savings account. Um, and in addition, life insurance proceeds are tax-free. Income uh, tax-free. The income tax free, yes. yeah, not estate tax free necessarily. So, yeah. Or inheritance tax. Right? Or an inheritance tax free, uh, yeah, but yeah. income tax free. Uh, life insurance policies are typically income tax free if they're uh, paid for with after tax dollars. Right. Um, so you also get the benefit of um, having that uh, as an income tax free death benefit as opposed to a taxable um, savings account. Uh, which is going to get hit with inheritance taxes, potentially income taxes, um, depending on, you know, what interest it's earning and things like that. So it's probably not a bad way to go to have both the savings account and the life insurance if it's affordable. And uh, as long as the premium, you're not going to pay out $30,000 over the same length of time because right. otherwise you might as well just save more money in that account or invest more money in that account if it's gonna be that expensive. So that's my, my quick and dirty advice um, for you. Any other questions tonight? Um, 
you know, I, I life insurance. One thing I think people always have to think about is who who their beneficiary designations are. Oh yeah. Because you don't want to leave it blank nine times out of ten, and you don't want to have the wrong name on it. So a lot of times, people may start a job. You know, there's a lot of people that work for the government. Let's say for twenty, thirty, sometimes forty, fifty years. And when they started, they might have not have been married or they might have been married to somebody else. So, you know, often you have to think about going back and changing or at least checking up on your beneficiary designation just to make sure that they reflect. And you're not thinking about that on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, <laughs> right. want back, you want to go back and, you know, check those uh, periodically just to make sure that everything's right. Yeah, I've had people change beneficiaries four or five times because they get mad at somebody and want to not keep them on the policy or <laughs> want to, you know, add this person for 5% and this person for 2%. Uh, their neighbor was real nice to them, so they want them to get a little something. So um, you can change them as often as you need to, uh, but definitely review them because I also have seen situations where um, somebody never changed it and had a second marriage and the ex-wife was boo. that old yeah, thing the, the old the, the, thing yeah, was the beneficiary moment. listed on that policy and chances are they're not going to be that nice and give you the money uh so no, you no, know periodically every anytime you have a major life transition or change you should also look at your uh beneficiaries and not just on you know life insurance but also on your 401k plan and any pension plans you might have as well because a lot of people think that stuff is controlled by your will it absolutely is not it's not they're separate contracts so they're all they all govern themselves so right be sure to, to double check and make sure that your beneficiary designations are right and correct sure so anything else you want to add tonight um no just get some insurance <laughs> <laughs> Make as sure. much as you can, right? As much as you can yes. afford, right? As much as you can afford to get, much as that, that makes sense. Um, don't leave your family out there. Um, it just is not necessary. Um, we we also think I, I think also in terms of uh, I do a lot of faith based financial planning, um, and as a, as an ordained minister, I also know that people sometimes leave their the charities that they support out of their estate planning and. Um, if they're if you're giving money during your lifetime, then you might want to consider it even uh, after you're gone. Uh, a lot of times, our institutions don't get the benefit of uh, other institutions that get endowment funds and are written into the wills and to the life insurance plan. So we're always struggling selling dinners and uh, doing things like that, where you know our members pass away and and don't think about uh, leaving to the charities that they support, that whether churches, mosques, synagogues, um, wherever you worship, wherever you're, you're living, um, alumni associations, uh, scholarship funds, um, anything that you support during your lifetime, uh, you might also wanna consider supporting even at death and, and writing them in. I have them listed as beneficiaries on my policy um, hopefully nobody clubs me over the head when I leave here tonight, but, uh, it is something that, um, I take seriously because I'm charitable. So I want to make sure that, um, even if I go away, that the things that I support in the community that I serve, I will still benefit from, um, financially, even if I'm not here. So, um, make sure that you consider charitable giving, even in your overall estate planning. All right, so last question for tonight, because I forgot you were an ordained minister. You forgot. <laughs> I, did. I don't know how I forgot. Me and Shana actually worked on a show called God and Money because God or faith or religion, however you want to label it, really dictates um, how a lot of people move with their money. And so that was always something I'm fascinated about, still fascinated about. But I wanted to ask you, should since we're talking about tithing and most people consider you know a minimum of 10 percent of all that they get to go to the kingdom should people be leaving the church as a beneficiary for at least 10 percent of whatever the, that benefit is i think it's up to them i wouldn't give them a 
I wouldn't dictate a percentage to them of, of what they should or should not leave. I think that's um, not necessary, but I think it's something that they should consider in terms of, um, you know, what they want to give. It could be five, it could be 10, it could be 20. I've, I've seen people leave uh, the majority of their funds to um, making sure that uh, the, the, in, the places that they support, particularly places of worship, um, get the majority of their funds. Um, that if their kids are fine financially, then they say, well, they don't need it. I want to leave it to, to the church. So um, I wouldn't put a percentage on it, but I do think that they need to uh, add it. Okay. So they should give to the church. They, they should. Yes. Would, it, would you consider that part of a tithe? Tithe. Um, sure. I guess. <laughs> it's, yeah. Part of the tithe. Gotcha. I mean, we're not, we're not in the old Testament. So um that that type of law i wouldn't give it's we're, we're under grace so is it a good practice and principle absolutely and i think that god honors that when you honor him with the first fruits of of what you earn um, yeah, but i always get confused because sometimes people reference old testament and it's law and then other times they say it's not law we're under grace <laughs> so you, you know, I'm I'm just asking. I'm saying we're we're com we're commanded not to give under compulsion. Um, so if I demand that you give ten percent, um, I'm may I'm trying to make you do that. That's that's not the point of grace. So when and the pastor we, says you got paid this week, we pass in the plate, and y'all better give. <laughs> better. If I, if I have to beg people to do that, then they're not very smart. Well, ain't begging. That was a commitment. That was like some Moses up on high talking to a bush. Well, <laughs> it ain't part of the 10, but it, <laughs> it is definitely a part of good stewardship and honoring, um, you know, your faith and guarding against greed and guarding against um, consumerism, which we're plagued by constantly. If you're being generous with your money, um, then you have an opportunity to demonstrate your, your thanksgiving, your gratefulness, your gratitude, um, and support the things in the community that the church does support as well. So um, as African-Americans, we tend to give about 25% more than uh, our Caucasian counterparts in terms of giving. That was the last uh, really? survey that I saw. Yeah, we The church or in general? Uh, in general, but mostly the church, um, we give 25% more of our, our incomes are tend to be lower and our right. assets are lower, right. but we tend to give at, at higher levels at last, um, the last survey that I, I saw. Mm. So we tend to be a, a more generous people uh, in that sense. And we, we do give, but we don't often consider that at death. Um, that's where we do fall short. So we do it during our lifetime, but we don't consider it when we do our estate planning. Mm. And so we're then le leaving our institutions that we support without that financial benefit um, that they could have, you know, in your million dollar strategy, if we're gonna all leave 10%, um, that's the number that I chose, um, mm. that I give. Um, so I have, you know, 10% of my life insurance policy goes to um, the charities and the, the churches that I support, but, the uh in your million dollar strategy that's a hundred thousand dollars that would then go to these institutions well yeah you know I mean, in, in a, utopia, a lot of scholarship funds a lot of times so. it, it could it can do a lot yeah, a <laughs> scholarships lot. and building funds and we could fix the roof somewhere yeah yeah <laughs> well don, don johnson said hell no <laughs> i saw <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people say that. Yeah, hey, I respect <laughs> we don't got it. <laughs> yeah, I respect it. I respect it. <laughs> well, Shada, I, I definitely appreciate you joining us tonight. Let everybody know where they can find you at. You can find me, uh, my website for my company, www.getinsightts.com. Um, we're in Bala Kimwood, Pennsylvania, uh, right in the Saks Fifth Avenue building. Um, find us on the web. You can find me on my Twitter handle, Money Lady, Lady spelled L A D E E. Uh, <laughs> and uh, on Facebook under my name and uh, 
also my page for my book, Money on Purpose. Um, I have a page for that. You can find me at Money on Purpose on Facebook or Shana L. Harvey on Facebook as well. Um, no, I, I don't think I, I talk about your book. I'm sorry. I'm, that's okay. I talk about life insurance in the book too. So good. If you want more on life insurance, Money on Purpose, Finding a Faith-Filled Balance. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's on my website. Um, get your copy. Let me know what you think. Um, yeah. I wrote it under my maiden name, Lear. So okay. if you're looking and wonder if it's the same person, it is me. Same I person. Marry, so. All right. Well, before we check out, you know, I was just thinking, actually, I should have you come back on so we can do a uh, finance and faith talk as well. That would be fun. Yeah, <laughs> we haven't done that in a while. Yeah, we haven't done that in a while. Yeah. well thanks again Shannon. i appreciate everybody that joined us tonight again if you know anybody that needs life insurance and most people are usually underinsured um if they have any coverage at all share this with them um you know we do these shows every week because i feel one we don't talk about money enough if we don't talk about money enough how is it going to be possible for us to gain wealth so for me it's all about gaining wealth not just for yourself but for your family and your community so again i thank you all Share this with a friend. Next week, we'll be back at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Same Facebook place, same Facebook time. I'll see you all later. I'm Kamari Ellis. Everybody have a great night. Bye-bye.